So this is the presentation that I, I, would, I did earlier to the developers. So there's an internal, internal presentation uh, to, to the programmers uh, within, within IOHK. Some from other teams that, uh, that are not a part of the Cardano, but mostly, mostly the Cardano team. So it's a, it's a tech talk um, about a particular technique for um, specifying and testing. Um, and and this, is, this is part of my goal to um, improve the quality of our software over time. Um, you know, we, we built the initial system quite quickly, um, and uh, over time, you know, I've, I've, in previous talks I've talked about you know high assurance and all this stuff. But there's a lot of more short-term, uh, less sophisticated things um, that we can do. And and this and this talk is about is about one of those. So it's about how do we uh, think about specifying um, new components of our software, or if we're rewriting bits of the software to improve its quality. You know, where, where do we start from? We, we need to start from the specifications. How do, how do we think about those specifications? What's, what's a good uh, general purpose technique for doing so? You know, in, in previous talks, I've talked a lot about mathematics and, and whatever. And so this is a, a, a sort of, a, it is a mathematical technique, um, but it's very practical. And so this is why I was explaining this, this one to everybody. So it's, it's all about uh, abstraction. Um, and so I start off with the theory, with this, this box. Um, and, and some people point out, oh, it's a category diagram, but it doesn't matter. Um, so we start with a the theory, you know, which is a straightforward bit of mathematical theory. It's very, but it's very simple. And then I, I go on to explain, you know, how, how do you apply that theory to, um, to real world examples, particularly examples, you know, from, from our system. Uh, for example, at the moment, uh, as I mentioned during the talk, um, uh, colleagues of ours are, are rewriting, um, writing a new wallet backend. Um, and they're they're applying this technique as part of as part of that backend. There's many parts of our software that we could apply this technique. It's quite a general quite a general approach. Front end users are not really going to notice this kind of stuff. This is about software quality on the inside. Uh, I mean, what what do you notice? You notice the absence of things going wrong. Um, you know, what do we want? We want reliable software as well. I mean, we want all the features. We want things to be pretty, but we also want things to work. Uh, and working in the backend turns into building our software um, with with clear clear specifications and then being able to test them easily against those specifications. It's how do we build, um, build components that are simpler, easier to understand, reducing the accidental complexity. Try and, by starting with these kinds of, thinking about these things as mathematical abstract specifications makes it much easier to start at the beginning with what is the simplest possible thing I could do? Um, and then you fiddle with it until it becomes as simple as you can make it. Uh, and then you go and build it. Uh, and then you test it against that specification. And that gives you a lot easier way. I mean, it, the, the simpler specification leads to a simpler implementation, but it leads, and it leads to an implementation that can be tested easily, and it can be tested quite comprehensively. I mean, we, uh, the traditional way of, or uh, a way that people you know, often build software is they build a thing, and then they write lots and lots and lots of tests for it, kind of a kind of slapdash kind of approach. And it, that's a lot of effort, and it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of those different tests to um, get coverage of everything, and you don't really know that you've really covered everything. Um, and you, end, you often end up with accidentally complicated designs. If you start from, let's try as hard as we can to make a simple abstract description of what we're trying to achieve, um, then that leads through to a simple way of testing against that abstract specification. And you, you, you would then have a much stronger, um, much greater confidence that, that the thing we've built works, meets its specification. And we can understand what that specification is, it's simpler. Uh, whereas sometimes you build things and you keep tweaking it all the way through and by the end you're like, well, I've got this thing that it's quite complicated and it's quite hard to understand and maybe only two people understand it. And, uh, and, that, and that's not good, you know, you want everything to be as simple as you can make it. You know, sim simplicity leads to quality. And what does that mean for the end user? Yeah, it means the absence of failures. But it, you know, that, in a way that's not really very sexy, right? Um, um, you know, what's, what's flashy is user interfaces and cool new features. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, because there's money at stake, uh, quality is important. The, the absence of failure is, uh, is an important quality. Yeah, so I want to talk about specification. Uh, because before we can test anything, we need to have a specification. And, and I, so here I'm not talking about fancy things. I'm talking about the ordinary components that we write all the time. Okay, so, you know, I'm not talking about the kind of you know, we, we, you've heard people talking about formal development methodologies, blah, 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 right? I'm not talking about that stuff. 
Right? That's, that's much more sophisticated. I'm talking about just much more everyday, um, the, the kind of testing that we should be doing on new components that we're writing, uh, that we're working on at the moment. Um, and so the, the, key, the key thing is, how do we capture specifications uh, or techniques for capturing specifications? Um, so I want to do two, uh, I talk about the theory a little bit, and then talk about two case studies. One, one case study I'll, I'll talk about, which is the, the wallet rewrite that's happening right now. Um, Edward and Edsko are not here. They are solidly working all week. Um, it's peace and, peace and quiet for them. Uh, and they're working on, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe uh, so the, the, the wallet rewrite as, as a case study of, of what I'm just describing here. And then I want us to do uh, a much simpler instance of the same thing uh, in groups. Um, and we all work on it in like groups of three around a laptop for 20 minutes, and then we reconvene and, and discuss as a group, um, raise, raise points about what we've done um, to, try and, to try and, you know, try this as an exercise, basically. Um, because actually, I've been, I've been setting this, this, the one that we'll do as an exercise together, uh, I've been setting this as, a, as an interview question. Uh, and so I think it's probably a good idea if we um, look at it ourselves and make sure that, uh, uh, that, we can, that we can pass our own tests. Exactly, yeah. It's, uh, it's good, good to dog food, things like that. So, um, uh, yeah, okay. So let's start off with, so it, it, we're talking about specifications. And I've got this uh, unlabeled diagram over here, which will become labeled as we go along. Um, so there's different kinds of specifications. Um, and the kind I want to talk about um, I, you know, and, and, and I mean specifications in a, in a sort of programming, mathematically kind of way, not like big wordy documents, right? Um, so how do, we, how do we write, what kind of specifications do we have? We've got, so, sometimes you have a specification that says, uh, do something and achieve a result that looks like this, or achieve a result that has this property, right? That's, that's a style of specification, right, where you can say, the end result should have this property, it should look like this. But it doesn't say anything about how you get there. Right? It's a sort of non-constructive specification. Achieve this end result. Right? And those kinds of specifications are nice, uh, but it's not always easy to, there's lots of things which are hard to specify in that sort of style. Um, a very um, common style of specification that, I, that we can use, and the, the one that we'll, we'll talk about, is, is the style of specification where you've got a, uh, either a reference implementation or a very simple, executable, simplified version of what you're trying to do for real. Um, and that, that's what we will, the approach that we'll concentrate on. Um, so in, in the idea of a, I mean, if you have a reference implementation, that is a, is a simple instance of this idea, um, where you know, you, for some reason you've got you know, a, a version which is simpler, it might be low performance, and the idea is that it's either someone else wrote it and it's obviously correct, uh, or you wrote it yourself, and it's so simple that it's obviously correct, and then you use that to compare with your complicated high-performance whatever version. Um, so that, that sometimes works, right? But it, often, often that's a hard one to do as well, because your reference implementation is just as complicated as your real one. Um, you know, or, or maybe performance was not the problem. So you know, you, writing the reference implementation doesn't... Do, you, know, you can still make errors in your reference implementation. So um, sometimes that doesn't really help you. So, so the technique I want to talk about is, is very similar to the idea of having a reference implementation, but it's having a much, much simpler reference implementation. Um, uh, much simpler than, than, than the real one, but still enough to give us interesting uh, specifications and specifications that we can test in an executable way, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in using quick check and all that kind of thing. So uh, we will come towards this diagram then. So. Um, Start labeling things. Uh, so at the bottom here, the, the, this blue one, this is the, um, the real implementation of something. Um, and it takes some input and it produces some result. Um, and this might be, I mean, you know, this looks like it's just a sort of pure function. Um, impl, the implementation here. Um, but this could be something that's much more complicated, like it could be the entire node, it could be the wallet, and the, you know, the input here is the entire sequence of the blockchain and the output is the state at any particular point or something. So this is you know, some, some kind of implementation that given a whole bunch of stuff over a period of time has some state or produces some results, whatever. The, the details don't matter too much. Um, uh, we, we, can, we can apply the same technique 
uh, even if it's not a simple pure function. Um, and then at the top, we have our, um, our reference implementation. And so, okay, so these, these things represent you know, the, the, the type of data that we have on the input and the, the type of data that we have as the output. Like, for example, with the wallet, we will have, let's say, the state of the wallet at, at a particular point in time, and the input was a whole bunch of blocks, let's say. Um, so that, and that's not a pure function, right? The wallet is this stateful, mutable thing. But you, know, you, you can, if you step back a bit, you can, you can, you can treat it like that. And so what is, what is this thing, then? So this is the reference or the specification. Uh, reference. Um, and it is also a function or a, a thing like a function um, that takes some input and produces some output. Um, but it doesn't produce the same types as, as, as this one. This one takes you know, the, actual, the actual blocks as defined in the current code and et cetera. And this takes something else. So the idea is that this is supposed to be something that is analogous to that, um, but is radically simpler, much, much simpler. Um, and then, OK, then, and it produces some output. And then we'll, let's talk about what these things are. So, oops. And the, the, the direction of these arrows is important. So the relevance is that um, this is a, uh, I don't know what we call that one. This, this one's always called abs for abstraction. And this one's for making things more concrete. I, I can't remember. What's the standard? Is there a standard name for this one? Chain? Sorry? Oh, reify. reify. And, then, and then what would the other one be? Abstraction, abstraction and reification. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Doesn't really matter what we call it. So, okay, what, what's, what's, the whole, what's the whole story then? The point is, that we, go f that we want to start with a, a radically simpler, or if you like, more abstract uh, version of the, of the real input. So if this is, um, so the, the first example we're going to look at is going to be the wallet and blocks. So let, let's say that this implementation is the wallet, and, and this is uh, the, the data types that we actually use for, to represent blocks. I and mean, this is not, not necessarily the binary encoding, but the you know, the internal representation of, of blocks. Um, so then this is the much simpler form of, that represents some of the information in here, the, the sort of important bits of information in here. Um, so uh, then we have a function that goes from the much simpler version into the, the real one, um, at which we can then push through the implementation and get some output, or some, some state at some point after pushing all the blocks through, let's say. And then we have another function that goes the other direction, the abstraction function that, that takes only the, um, that, that forgets some of the information, transforms it in some way, to take us back to a simpler corresponding output. And then the whole point is we say that to go for, going from here to here should be the same as going from here to here. So the, the, the composition of, I mean, if you were to, to do this in a, um, uh, if, if these were pure functions, then you would be saying that uh, abs uh, composed with the implementation composed with reify equals the spec. That, that, that's, the, that's the formally the property that this diagram represents. But yeah, what you're doing is you're, you're starting off with some uh, some input that you generate over here. And you can use quick check generators to generate some input here. And you push it through your reference implementation to get you know, what, what the specification says the output ought to be. Um, and then you, you, you take that same input, reify it, push it through the real implementation, push it through the abstraction function, and you should come out with the same result. And then, so that, that tells you that your real implementation computes the same thing as what your specification computes. So, does that, does that make sense to start with? Yeah. Um, so then the question is, what, what should this be like and what should these things be like? Um, how much simpler should they be? What are we trying to capture? Um, so, okay, so then let's, um, we, can, if we can then move on to the uh, case study in a second. Um, let's see, so what are the other, so, okay, let, let's just label the other important points on the diagram. Um, because this, this will be the, like, we'll keep this one as the theory one, then we'll flip this one over as we go along. So uh, over here, we're going to be uh, like using 
quick check to generators to, to generate our, our abstract input. Um, we, we have to implement a reify function to go from the abstract to the concrete. Uh, we have our real implementation, uh, which we will have to discuss how we run this in this, in this setting. Um, and then we have our abstraction function and gets us back to the, uh, the abstract output. Um, what was the other things I was going to label here? Oh, yeah, and then obviously what we're doing here is we're checking that these two things are equal. Right, so the, fi the final test property is that they come out the same with the same result. Um, and this can be the implementation or uh, simulation. So this might be some way of running the real implementation in a simulated way, in a simulated environment, um, if, if we can do that. Um, and you might need to do that so that we can run it you know, hundreds of times in a, in a sort of quick check style uh, test suite. Um, so it may, so this, this kind of approach will then lead on to it being rather important to be able to run our implementations in a simulated way. Uh, and there are techniques for that, um, uh, which I won't go into right now. Uh, but Andres might, maybe, in, in his talk Thursday. Maybe. There, there, are some there are some connections. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Okay. Good. Good. All right. So let's let's look at the first uh, case study then. So I, I've mentioned uh, the the wallet, uh, and the wallet is a really nice example that fits this pattern very well. So um, we're we're currently, as you know, rewriting the the wallet code, um, and particularly it's it's not the, the bit of the wallet that that's problematic is nothing to do with like. HD derivation trees and all that. It's, it's about the, the state that it maintains. Um, so what, what is it that a wallet does? Uh, I mean, okay, it sends transactions, but the other major, the other major thing that it does is maintain uh, information about the state of the blockchain that corresponds to your, your wallet, to your, the addresses that make up your wallet. So um, the, the major thing that it's, that it's doing is it's... So, so the, fir the first step of, of this is to say, Okay, well, what is, what is the specification of the wallet? Um, and let, let's try and simplify as much as we can. Um, what are the critical things the wallet does? So there's, and, and the way that we've looked at it is we say, well, it breaks down into sort of two major parts. There's information that's derived from the blockchain, um, and then there's sending transactions. Um, so let's, and let's focus on the first bit, okay? The information that's derived from the blockchain. Um, now, so if you look at that, um, you know, the, 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 the shape of the blockchain uh, and the way that it grows should tell you straight away that, you know, it, it, it's, it's a list. It's a list of blocks or a list of transactions abstractly, right? That, that's the first step of abstraction to say, well, okay, yes, obviously it has all these details of pointers and hashes and blah, 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 but fundamentally it's a list of blocks or even it's a list of transactions. If you forget the boundaries between blocks, it's a list of transactions. Um, and then what is it that we're computing? Um, what is it the wallet maintains? It maintains, uh, you have to be able to ask questions like what's the balance uh, or what's, uh, but one of the major things that the wallet maintains is the UTXO, the UTXO of, the, of your account uh, or your accounts in, in your wallet. So uh, that tells us that, yeah, one of the major things that, it, that the, the wallet is doing is it's, it's got this, uh, this list and, it's, and at any particular point you've got the the summary of this uh, is the UTXO. That's not the only thing it computes, but it's one of the major ones. And indeed, everything else that the wallet computes has to be computed in this style as well, either directly from the chain or from the chain and based on other things that are computed from the chain or just based on things computed from the chain. Like, you could compute the balance, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but I think you can compute the balance just by looking at the UTXO. There's, there's details to do with pending transactions as well. But, um, so you could compute the balance by looking at the UTXO, but the UTXO can, has to be computed by having, in principle, having looked at the entire history of the chain. And obviously we know that because you do that every 20 seconds, we need to do this by incrementally updating. The, 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 I mean, the UTXO is a summary of everything, that's, everything of interest that has ever happened, uh, but it's a summary that we have to maintain incrementally because you know, the chain grows every 20 seconds and we can't, it's madness to, to go and scan backwards through the chain. Um, so what does this 
uh, suggest to us, we're computing a, everything that we compute is computed in this style of step-by-step -step incremental updates to a running accumulator. Somebody shout out, what's, anybody, come on. What, what, what's, what's, the first, what's the first thing that comes to mind? State, state? like state monad, yep, that's, that's a good one. Go on, Neil. It's a fold. What kind of fold? <laughs> what kind of fold? How many kinds of folds are there? Two. Say again. So is it, okay, there are left folds and there are right folds. Which one is this? Yes, it's a left fold. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you had the 50-50 chance there. No, no, no. You, you knew the right answer. You knew the right answer. So, so the UTXO function here uh, is a function from, okay, well, I didn't say what this chain was, but let's say, let, let's say that it, we're ignoring blocks and we're just interested in transactions. So we'll say that it's a, the blockchain is a list of transactions to the type UTXO, uh, which is, we've not specified it, but it's some kind of map or whatever. Um, and we're saying that it necessarily is computable as a, fold L of something and something. Details to be decided. Um, but the point is it, it must be computable in that style for us to be able to do anything, for us to be able to do this. It must be a fold L. Um, so this already, this, this is now, um, if, if we can fill in these details here, which is it's not, not too hard to do, um, this can become our reference implementation, our, our specification of what does it mean to correctly compute the UTXO from the blockchain, right? And, the, and, and this embodies all the things that we've got here. So let's see how this map, maps up, matches up. So this, this UTXO function is this function, uh, and the input here is this chain, the, the list, of, list of transactions. And as you can see, that is radically simpler uh, than you know, the real chain, because the real chain has blocks, and it has Merkle trees, and it has pointers and hashes, and it's in a database, and blah, 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 blah. You know, this is, this is complicated, for good reasons. So this is the, the much, much simpler one, just a list of transactions, although, of course, it has to be, as a chain, it has to be valid, right? So there's, it's, this isn't just for any old list of transactions. It has to be, you know, there's, there's a validity condition of what, what makes a valid blockchain. But uh, it's not a detail we need to go over right now. Uh, then this, this type, obviously, is the, the output type here, which represents this blob. Okay, so that gives us this function. And this thing can be quite short. I mean, if we were to go through it, we're not going to go through it right now, this function would fit on the rest of this piece of paper, right? That's right. But, yeah, right. Thank you, George. <laughs> yeah. So this, is, this, is, this can be very simple, um, whereas in the real implementation, there's lots of stuff going on, right? Um, and there's lots of concurrency and state management and blah, 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 blah. Um, so that, in this example, we use it to like, define what, what transaction because uh, based on this definition, we ask it. Go on, but George. Even, well, even in this uh, example, we should define what is transaction because based on yes. this, we can uh, have like uh, invalid uh, uh, mm -hmm. set, set of transactions. And then it's not UTXO, but maybe UTXO, something like that. Yeah, no, you're right. We need, we need to know what is a transaction, what is our representation of transactions, and what is the validity condition? That's, that's absolutely right. Um, so uh, the approach that we're taking, um, that Edsco and uh, uh, Edward are taking right now, is that um, they don't have to start from scratch here because we already have a, a mathematical uh, formalization of a very simplified form of UTXO accounting. Uh, because Bruno um, was given the task a few weeks ago of um, writing down a simple mathematical description of UTXO style accounting and Ethereum style accounting and trying to match the two up. And so he's, you know, he's gone and read a couple of papers and he's done a few, you know, a, a simple um, sort of mathematical description of what is UTXO style accounting and how does it relate to Ethereum. But we can just grab the, that bit, you know, the, the UTXO style account. It's like three pages of a LaTeX document that Bruno's written down. And so he's already come up with uh, a nice uh, description of what are transactions precisely, what, what do they consist of, uh, and what does it mean for a chain to be valid. And so we can, we can just take that 
and use that exactly as our, so like last week, Edsco took uh, Bruno's paper and took the first three pages and translated it into Haskell and that becomes the, the transaction type, the chain and the function for, for computing the UTXO and the balance from the UTXO. Um, and that stuff's all very small. And, and we already know that's a sensible definition because he's already gone through and um, written some lemmas about how, how these things relate to other things. And uh, Anyway, um, so, so it means that we've, we, we've, we're starting off in a, with a sensible, very, very simplified form of transactions in UTXO style accounting. I think it was worth mentioning here that we... <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning here that uh, for Wallet, we actually want to go from UTXO representation to accounting representation. And uh, Bruno was uh, effectively proving, if, I, if, if we talk about the same thing, he was effectively proving the equivalence be between yeah. account base and UTXO base. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Bru Bruno, Bruno's looking at the relationship between Ethereum style accounting and UTXO style accounting because we want to be able to move value from one to the other uh, for all this sidechain stuff. Um, so that, that's why he was looking at it. But then it became a very useful um, bonus because Edsco didn't have to like, you know, go and work this out himself. He could just go and steal it from Bruno's, uh, Bruno's work already. Uh, okay. Um, now, so, so what does this throw out? This throws out uh, blocks. Uh, it throws out signatures. Um, so all the cryptography stuff is gone. It just has the essential thing about transactions, inputs and outputs. Uh, and what is a UTXO and how is it computed? So this, you're right, so this gives us, you know, we could, we, could, we, could write, we could finish writing this down and we could all agree that this is a correct description of computing the UTXO from a chain. And so then that gives us our reference implementation. So now we're in a good, a good point, we've got this thing. Um, so then the, the, the next task to, uh, to flesh this out with the wallet, uh, and this is what Edsco was started on last week, is writing this function. To, to go from this representation uh, into, uh, into the real uh, blocks. Um, and so, uh, and, and this is where it's actually very useful, in, in just a side point in the wallet code, it's very useful to have pure functions for constructing these blocks. Um, uh, one, one of the things that he found was that there are pure functions, but they're buried kind of deep inside. And all, all, the, all the things are exported, um, or all in terms of effects that then also push things into the database or, um, and he wants just pure functions for just constructing these blocks so that he can implement this reify function. Um, so that, that's a, a useful thing to bear in mind. For, for these kind of testing things, it's very useful to be able to have pure functions that construct the, these, these data types. I have an absurd comment on this. So basically we'll have a block generator and you know. All right, so I have a short comment on this. Uh, we, have, we already have the block generators, as everybody knows. Yes, that's right, but, it, but it doesn't like help it, us it, here. It, it, uses, it, it uses the functionality from the core, and yep. the problem is we cannot, like, it doesn't make any sense to, to write any pure functions construction blocks because it is uh, very cumbersome, it's a lot of code, and it will be, it will be duplication, basically. What we did is we abstracted a lot of, a lot of core components instead of the block generator. You can use pure d database with it, but it's like it, it can be effectively pure except for maybe some 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 things with logging. So, so I, I, I have to respectfully pure. disagree. Um, the, the the block generator is useful that that code that, that that is there, but the fact that it isn't pure means that we can't really use it here, because we we need to generate those blocks without pushing them into the into the chain or into the database or into the system. We need to just have them in memory and then do something with them. Uh, whereas the, the current block generator, uh, you can only um, you, you start from some, some input about what you want to do, and then it, it generates the blocks and it pushes it into the, um, into the stateful part of the system and pushes it out through the B listener and, and all the rest of it. And we need to be able to do just make me a block that's valid um, without doing anything else. Right? Um, yeah, sure, I get the point. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's what the first, so when, when Edsco started on this last week, um, the first thing that he decided that needed to be done was, well, yeah, find, finding this stuff, find, you know, constructing this function, or at least fi just constructing the, finding the types for these things from, from the paper, and then started on writing this function. And because that was, that, was, that was the first thing that he thought of, it was like, okay, well, we talked about what the specification ought to be, and his first thought is, okay, now how are we going to be able to test it? So before we've, we've really written, 
before they'd really written any part of the new code, it's how are we going to be able to construct this kind of, this kind of test? Um, so yeah, started on that. Um, this, the function in the other direction, um, well, what's it going to be in this context? It's going to be a function that goes from the, uh, let's see, what's the type? The abstraction function. I mean, basically, it goes from the, uh, the real implementations UTXO uh, to the, the sort of the specification style UTXO. So it's just a conversion of representations. Um, and of course, that loses a lot of information. I mean, the real UTXO has, you know, the real uh, transaction IDs and, you know, there's, there's more, more detail in there. But it's basically just a conversion, you know, deep, a deep conversion of all the data types, um, going, going back to the, the much simpler uh, style of UTXO that came from the, um, from the specification. So then how do we put that all together? Um, so in the wallet code that they're looking at, they want to be able to test, they want to be able to do a unit test of the wallet without having any part of the core. They want to be able to test the wallet completely on its own. And so um, the, the, the first thing to do there was to identify what is the boundary, what is the interface between uh, the, the core code and the wallet. And it turns out there is actually a very nice simple uh, boundary, which is this B listener interface, if any of you've looked at it. But it and it's basically just, here's a block, or here's a block that's being rolled back. Uh, it's a sort of notification interface uh, to say that we're moving from here to here, or we're rolling back, we're moving from here to here. Um, so that, that gives a, a, nice, a nice narrow interface between the wallet and the, and the, the core code. Um, the core code informs the wallet that a block has been added, or the core code informs the wallet that a, a block has been rolled back. Um, uh, and that, actually, so that, that's, no, maybe I won't go into that diversion. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and then let's see, uh, where was my train of thought going on this? Um, yeah, so you've got this narrow interface, and then the point is that we can um, use that interface uh, as part of this kind of style testing without having the core code in there at all, without having, sorry, without having the node in there, so any of the state of the blockchain, right? Well, obviously, the, the wallet code makes use of function calls from the core, but it, it's not going to have the blockchain in there. So what we do, or what we are going to do, is that we generate all these blocks, uh, and then we just push them straight in through the B-Listener interface. So we don't, we have the wallet code, which has its you know, B-Listener API that it responds to. Here, here's a block, here's a block, here's a block. And we just do that. We just push in a block into the wallet code and say, here is a whole sequence of 1,000 blocks or whatever, and here's one that got rolled back. Um, without having the, without it being running in the context of the node. Um, and then that will let us, and then, you know, after pushing in 100 blocks, we can ask the wallet, you know, what is your current UTXO? Push it through the abstraction function and check that it's equal to the UTXO that we're expecting. Um, and that way we're able to get, you know, a, a unit test of the wallet or of, you know, the UTXO computation of the wallet and all the other similar things that are computed from the chain. Um, uh, without having to test it in the context of the entire rest of the node. Because if you do it in the context of the node, you've got to, it's hard to do rollbacks, right? Um, you've got to, I mean, the, the real chain doesn't roll back very often. I mean, it, so far it never has, right? Um, so, of course, we will also do integration tests, but, you know, you, you want to be able to do them as, as small as possible first, so you test the logic there, and then you do the integration. So, but we can, do, we can do the same pattern of tests uh, for the integration as well, uh, it'll be, we, won't get, we won't get rollbacks in that case, um, or at least it'd be a bit harder to, to achieve them. Um, but in that case, we just, we just change what our implementation or simulation is here. Um, and we, instead of pushing them straight into the B-Listener interface of the wallet, we will push them into the, the, you know, the, the node, and it will apply it to its database, and it will inform the wallet that uh, something happened. Or we could go even one step back and say, instead of pushing blocks in, we will push transactions in one by one, uh, and again, check that the UTXO comes out right at the end. Um, so we can do that same, this same style of test at, just at the wallet, or at the wallet and node, or at the um, further out, you know, all the way to pushing transactions in from fully from the outside. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that on that case study? Um, where's where's the uh, the mic? Sorry, where? Run run around. Here we go. Thanks. Right, so is it on? 
Okay. Yes, I okay. have a question regarding the reification stage. Uh, yeah. Namely, if so, since we're converting from a simpler representation to a more complicated one, it's possible that we are mapping to a large number of possible values in the more complicated section. Or maybe even in some circumstances, no values. So for instance, if the simpler representation allows some things that the more complicated one forbids for some reasons. Uh, so how do you deal with yeah. that? Are you, w would you test uh, several different things? Would you do that non-deterministically or how do you approach okay, that? Okay, so the, 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 the choice of this representation should be such that everything that exists here should be mappable into something over here. Um, so we shouldn't be generating, we shouldn't have a representation here that allows things that don't make sense over here. I'm, I'm not sure if, I, I see situations where it would make sense to have a simpler representation where things don't map into the more complicated ones. Not well, necessarily well, then it makes, it makes it very hard to do a reify study. function. Um, well, yes, but that was my question. Yeah, like, okay. How would you approach that? Well, the answer is you don't do that. The answer is that you, you, you get to choose what this representation is. Okay. And you, you, ch you choose it as an abstraction of this thing. Okay. And so uh, the, everything that can be represented here can be mapped down to this thing by forgetting the bits that you don't right. care about, and everything that exists over here can be mapped back into. And so there's a, there's a property that if you combine the reify and the abstraction, or, or if you, well, these are in different types here, but uh, you could go in the opposite direction, and you should get back to the same thing. Um, Maybe to say specifically what I was thinking of to make it more clear, I was thinking of in the context of smart contracts, you might, mm -hmm. for instance, encounter a situation that uh, the abstract notation doesn't deal with uh, computation limits, so what in Ethereum would be gas limits and so on. Gen uh, generating random programs is always very tricky. Um, do, doing this kind of stuff with programs, smart contracts, is, 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 is hard. Okay. I mean, that, that's a whole topic in itself, is how do you generate valid, right. simple programs. Um, so maybe, maybe you could then still answer how would you deal with mapping to multiple uh, possible values. So for instance, in this situation you have uh, that you, in the abstract representation, have a list of transactions, and then mm -hmm. in the concrete one you have blocks. Yeah. So there are multiple ways to distribute mm -hmm. that, obviously. Yep. How you, would you deal with that? Yeah, uh, th that's a very good point. Th there is extra detail here, and you have to make a decision about that. Uh, and um, so you, you want, I mean, because we're doing sort of, you know, random quick check style generation, we want to do that in ways that, but th that covers all the possibilities. So uh, we would just add enough extra arguments to our reify that says, um, that would, that would control how they end up in blocks uh, so that we can, as part of the quick check test, say, well, let's, let's try it and make sure that we get cover cases where there's empty blocks as well as non-empty as well as to get, to get a reasonable coverage of the, of the, of the space of possibilities. Um, okay, uh, so it's not, a, it's not a pure function from the abstract. Well, it, it, it may be a pure function that has additional it, arguments. Okay. And yeah. we, we make use of those additional arguments to, to cover the, the, the space of... Um, of possibilities in the, in the richer type down here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's, the, what's the time now? How are we doing for time? 10 plus 12. 10 plus 12. Okay, all right. So now, the, what, we'll, what I want everyone to do now is uh, in like groups of two or three, uh, we want to look at the next case study, which is much simpler. This one is, you know, is like several weeks of work. Uh, I want to do one that's like 20 minutes. Um, and so the, 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 the task is, we want to specify, but we're not going to actually implement and test, but at least specify uh, the voting system that we have in Cardano, or at least a simplification of the voting system that we have in Cardano. We can, if, you, if you have time, you can do the next step. So uh, the question is, and this is the, this is the question I used in interviews, is um, how would you uh, test, an, well, the interviews question is how you test it, which is this thing as well. Um, but how would you specify um, in this kind of style, right? You know, a simple function that captures the essential details, um, a reference implementation. How would you specify the voting system? So, what are, what are the, what is, how does the voting system work in Cardano, or at least a simplified version? George will jump on me if I get the details wrong, but it's the point is we're trying. To, the yeah, but the, yeah. So we're 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 we'll, we'll add a second detail later. Um, but if we take a simplified form, we say that at some point someone proposes a an update. Um, uh, and they, okay, there's a detail that they had to have had a certain number of signatures, blah, blah, blah. We'll ignore that. We'll say someone, someone's allowed to propose an update. And then uh, everybody votes. Um, and after a deadline, at the deadline, we make the decision um, as to whether the vote succeeded or, or failed. And at the moment, and we do that on a simple majority of the people who voted. 
Right. Now, there is a detail that we won't cover initially unless, unless you do it, and we can, we can add the extra complexity later, which is the, the vote can actually end early. But for the, for the simple one, let's start with, let's specify it that uh, at, at the deadline, we make the decision about did the vote pass or fail. Okay. So what I want you to do is to, in groups of two or three, think about that problem. I, I've underspecified it, deliberately underspecified it. Right? So that there are things that you will have to go, well, okay, what information do we actually need to work this out? You know, there'll be things that, the, 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 the concrete, when you start to write this down concretely, you have to be precise. And you realize, oh, we need this information, we need that information. So discuss that amongst yourselves. And uh, we, let's reconvene in 15 minutes. And um, I'll ask a couple of groups to uh, raise, raise points that they've noticed, and we can, we can discuss. Is that, is that OK? Is, that, is the problem clear? Any, any questions? Yeah. Apart from my deliberate underspecification? I can repeat the specification if you like. Yeah. OK, specification is the vote, the vote starts when someone proposes an update. Everybody gets to vote. That's vague. But that's the idea. Everybody gets to vote at the deadline, and there's a specified deadline. Let, let's just say that it's you know some some number of slots or some number of some period of time. At the deadline, um, the vote passes or fails based on a simple majority of the people who voted, or of the of the stake that voted. So the details about stake and blah 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 timing, that that's for you to flesh out, uh, and then try and try and do a simplified uh, um, clarification. clarification. Yes. We can do, yes, for, for now, let's just do one proposal at a time. Someone, someone volunteer, otherwise I will start volunteering people. All right, do you want to uh, grab the mic? So remember, the, 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 the point was I asked you to implement this spec or reference implementation. You don't have to worry, and, which means you've got to choose what these types are, but you don't have to think about the rest of it. All right, go ahead. Okay, so our, um, our specification was pretty simple. Um, we, def we, we define a vote as con consisting of an amount of stake and a, and a, f a for, for or against. Okay. Um, then uh, the specification says we take an, an unordered set of votes okay. and produce a result. Okay. Um, and the, the, basically, if, the, if, if we, if we add, add up all the, all the stake for the things which are for and subtract all the stake for the things that are against, Mm -hmm. If the result is greater than or equal to zero, um, it passes, otherwise it fails. And we allow our, our, our set of votes to be empty, Okay. in which case it fails. Okay, so, what was, so let, let's review the details. So the, the, the representation here was a set of votes. Set, yes. Uh, and the vote was the, a pair of stake. stake and for or against. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, uh, does anyone want to... Comment on that? Um, we have four minutes. Right, so, so first of all, any comments on, on this style or approach? And then, and then we'll go around and do other, other people's approaches. Does anyone uh, want to comment yeah. on? So stake is actually already uh, like an enhancement uh, of, uh, the, like it's, it's already a more complex, uh, not, not the most simplified uh, model. So if you need to consider stakes, it's okay. But if there is no such requirement, you can consider that uh, every person has just one stake, so you just uh, have number of people vote positively or negatively. Okay, so this is the first point, was that my, my specification was ambiguous. Right? I, didn't, I didn't mention stake, but this is a, uh, you know, when, when you come to, I mean, yeah, we, it, ultimately we have to consider stake, right? Um, the, even in this sort of, sort of, you know, I've given you a simplified form of the problem, but uh, you know, if I hold five percent of stake and you hold fifty percent of stake, you know, our votes are different. Um, so I think I think considering stake is, I mean, this is a choice about what what is the exercise. But if you think about what would we be doing for the real specification of the system, obviously we must we must consider stake. Yeah. So if you've not considered stake, that's okay. Uh, but if you have, then yeah, that that is that is a detail of the system that we need to need to in include. So absolutely. The uh, yeah st st the the outcome of the vote. So we need to know as part of the input what what the uh, what the stakeholders stakes are. Um, so one th one thing I spot about your approach. Uh, one thing that makes me wonder is what about uh, can I can I vote more than once? Um, what is what is your state your set representation? 
do with that? So, so with... <laughs> Sorry, lots of running around with mics. Uh, so we've, uh, we've, uh, we've abstracted away from all the questions of how we authenticate votes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, we, 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 we just and got rid of the order as well. Uh, we've, just, we've got away from the order, so, so, so the specification is we have a set of votes. We didn't say how we got them. Yep. Um, and the voting system returns a result when we're specifying what the result should be. Okay, so we're not, and, and we're not capturing the detail of can I vote? Can I vote, can I vote once? Bo yeah. Both ways, more than yeah. once, yeah. etc. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, so that, that you, you simply said that's out of scope. We're saying that we're, ta we're taking that as out of scope. Okay, yes. all right, that, that is a legitimate decision. Uh, okay, uh, any other uh, volunteers to um, George? Just one comment. Also, it's question: Should we consider, like, are we? Is, is it out of our scope that uh, some votes uh, could uh, go after deadline, uh, or is it so? So, if we have some vote after deadline, we should uh, ignore it, or mm -hmm. we should uh, uh, cancel uh, a whole voting, or we say that uh, like all votes that are passed into our function, they are just uh, they, they haven't all before deadline and we don't, uh, don't not need to consider this particular deadline. Well, um, let's think about what we would do, if we're doing this for real, what would we do? We would say, well, of course, we can't control uh, when people's votes end up in, and, unless, uh, we, we probably can't control when they end up in the chain. And so we say, if they can exist past the deadline, but they will be ignored. So our, our specification would have to allow for, as input, votes that take place, uh, votes that are after the deadline, but the, the specification would say that they obviously contribute nothing towards the, um, the result. Yeah, and also it uh, makes even more sense in extended versions that you converse that uh, in, in which uh, you can have majority of votes uh, hit uh, before deadline. And if you consider this version, you certainly need to engage. Like That's right, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's worth noting that in the real system, uh, the, the voting rules are slightly more complicated where we allow the votes to end early if, and what's the rule exactly, George? If an absolute majority uh, of yeah, all stakeholders, yeah, yeah, not yeah. just those voting, but an absolute majority of, of stake has voted one way or the other, yeah, then yes, the vote yes. ends early. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes, yes. So the, the, for, for doing this for real, we would have to incorporate that, that detail yeah, because, into our... Because deadline is, uh, like, uh, it's, it's designed in such a way that uh, in uh, average case, we'll have vo vote, uh, like we'll have voting process to end up as, as fast as possible as soon as we have majority in this table. Okay, next uh, volunteer over this table. So, so we, we considered a couple of other things. Yeah, okay. One was the notion of the majority versus the total set of stake, the vote people actually vote or not vote. Mm -hmm. And one of our questions back to the management would be, what's your policy for people who don't vote? Right? Because that's a question about yep. majority, notion of majority. Yep. Secondly, is that we had the notion of sequence mm -hmm. that somebody would propose, mm -hmm. and then people would receive proposals, and then they would vote on proposals. We didn't consider, well, we must admit, we didn't consider double voting, okay. but we did consider the notion that there was a deadline, which mm -hmm. was part of the proposal um, at the beginning. Okay. And then we were starting to refine down to the level of what were the transitions that would be seen mm -hmm. um, by either one, by the actor performing the action or the ones that are just watching the blockchain. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, how the sequences of, of things would start to occur. Okay. okay. Um, do you want to say something more, did you, or? Oh, I was going to say something else. Yeah, okay. And then I want to volunteer from over here somewhere. <coughs> so, uh, so the, the, the uh, so, so I think our assertion is that, is that everything, everything that everybody else has just said already represent, represents a reification of this spec. A reification. Right, in, uh, the, in the sense that if you start thinking about, oh, we're yes. going to end the voting early, or uh, we're, you know, the question of whether someone voted before the deadline or not, we're saying, but that's all taken care of by, we've, this, this is the set of people whose votes count. Yes, and because your, your version is more abstract than most other people's. More abstract. So, which so means that you, you, but that means that you can't capture the details of People voting twice. Absolutely. So, voting, so, so, because the so, representation doesn't so allow you could, for it. So, so you, I mean, you can extend this approach to, 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 to stack more on top. Yeah. That's right. If, if yeah. you want to. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. 
Uh, someone, someone from this table. I'm volunteering you. All right, sure. So um, we we considered the idea of having a proposal with a start time and an end time. Okay. And so the proposal of, itself says, well, it, it starts now or starts at some, at some slot number and ends at some other slot number. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then this notion of having ballots where uh, each ballot has an associated amount of stake and okay. uh, whether it's in favor or against. Okay, so each, each vote is a, just a pair of the stake of the, 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 like the percentage stake of the stakeholder or the absolute stake of the stakeholder and yes or no, whether yep. they're voting for or against. Yep, okay. And, and also time. We, we it's like the slot number or something. Yep. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we had this notion of just making sure that we're looking at a set of ballots uh, that fall within the time range specified by the given proposal. Mm -hmm. And then from there, just tallying up the total number of the, the total amount of stake in favor versus against. Mm -hmm. If there is a majority in favor, then it's considered ratified. Okay. That sounds that sounds eminently defensible. So this, the summary there is that you've got a list of events, things of interest, which is ballot being started, which tells you what slot it ends in, and the, the list also contains the votes. And then your specification is a function from that list of events votes, proposals, et cetera, to a yes or no, and what time slot the yes or no occurs, something like that. Yeah. George, do you want to comment on that? Or uh, yeah, yeah. Add I want your... to, to comment. Uh, also interesting is that uh, uh, when we've been testing it, we were actually having like a sequence of events which are like uh, one block applied or, uh, or one block rollbacks, something like that, and actually you can have like one bl block in place with new votes, but then you can have this block disappear and these votes uh, to uh, r roll back and actually voting uh, voting result might be already be in place, but then you uh, go back and uh, need to consider new votes and uh, de or delete uh, old votes. So this kind of thing also comes, comes to place when you uh, re-file all this stuff. No, that, that, that's actually a very interesting point. Um, yeah, the, the, it, it's very interesting that when you're dealing with a blockchain, of course, uh, you know the, the 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 last block is not stable, and so we shouldn't we shouldn't um, tally up the vote, you know, at during the slot in which the vote ends. We should actually tally the uh, the votes k slots after the vote ends, because that's the first time at which we know absolutely for sure that it will never ever change. Uh, yes, or, or so that, that's how it's changed. implemented. But uh, to test it, you probably would like to. Like try like okay, it it probably assumes only a stable slot, but what if we like try try to do it like to try to induce some instability? Yeah. Like would it survive? Is it actually so, implemented? So the, so the point here is that there's a, there's a, an iterative sort of refinement of the specification that you you start off by thinking like like the the most abstract one, and then you add add you you add complexity into your specification by considering these issues one by one, like the, oh, we can vote more than once, we need to know slot times, we need to know, and then you make the, the valid point that with a blockchain, things can be rolled back, so, so when do we know it's stable? And we, we can, I'm, I'm confident that we can capture that notion as part of the specification as well. It's still in this very simple style. Um, and indeed, we could do the next step, which is ending voting early as soon as. Um, uh, um, yeah, I I just have one note. Um, not about the spec as much, but like if you if you um, and as soon as there is fifty percent of stake, and let's say you add the you know the case just to be sure that you mm -hmm. capture the the rollbacks, um, it, it's it's also for in terms of like practicality a bit weird because you could have a, an update in the middle of the night or something. It's not predictable, right? Um, but this this has you know maybe maybe you can capture this in the spec or not. But it has the you know the PR effect and, and so on. So if you announce the update is going to be rolled you know rolled out on Sunday and then suddenly it's on Friday, that might you know that, that that's a very important operational issue, which is uh, yeah. slightly hard to capture in these kinds of specifications. Yeah, it might have um, uh, different effects. By, yeah, no, you know, the maybe payload you, of maybe the you update. should include in your spec that uh, the validity condition of a proposal is that it can't end on a Sunday night. Uh, <laughs> you could you could totally do that if you want to. Uh, it's a question of how much detail you want to capture. Um, does any other table? Anyone over here want to? Go on, Alex. Um, I don't think we've actually added anything new. No, um, everything that we've done has already been mentioned. It was, we chose to use a list of events. List of events, yep. yeah. Yeah. Um, 
making a proposal. Um, the proposal is very simple. It's just an ID. There's nothing to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the votes, just a voter ID and um, a proposal ID. Um, okay. And then, of course... Ah, so your, your, your representation allows for more than one vote to be ongoing at once? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. And because you've got different identifiers for different proposals. That's right. That's right. And when you vote, you say which proposal you're voting on. Okay? Yeah. Yep. And we um, neglected to include any stake. Um, probably should have. But so I, I guess to... All right, so you incorporated one, one improvement <laughs> yeah, or yeah. one more, a bit of realism in that direction, but not the, not the stake one. Yep. And I suppose okay. to do the reification function for this, we would just choose a constant stake, maybe one stake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, and then to verify it, it's similar to what we see on the, on the whiteboard there. It's like a fold. You keep some some map of proposal IDs to um, current proposal state. Um, after, uh, you update the time after one has been, after the deadline's been reached, you, you check So you, you've passed. got an assumption that your, your events are in order yes, the and, they're, is that and they're tagged with their yes, slot number. Yeah. yeah. Well, we just, yeah, slot number, we, yeah. It could have been a slot number. Time, time, slot yeah. number, whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, we produce a, a list of output events in a way, so incrementally. Okay. So at at the time when a proposal has been handled, we say we say now that proposal is now finished. Right, because because your specification captures any number of. So we could have an infinite list of input events, and we would incrementally produce an infinite list right. of output events. And 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 is your is your executable specification small enough to be you know fit on kind of one slide, and uh, everyone would agree that it was correct? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, f 57 lines of code including, including types Type definitions. Yeah. Okay, so, that's, yeah. that's, that's still, you know, con considerably smaller than the real implementation, so. Okay, is, is there anything else, anyone else wants to add about, about this whole thing? Or, um, otherwise we can just wrap up and um, go and get some lunch. Uh, so let's see. What would what would I summarise from this? Um, th this is a this is a quite a general approach to testing lots of different kinds of components. Um, I think I think you can see that it's relatively uh, realistic that you can test you can test things like you know the wallets that are complicated and stateful. Um, you you have a lot of choice in how you choose your your abstraction your representations of these things. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I, I think it's a, a very useful technique to have in mind when you're starting or you're rewriting a new, re writing or rewriting some, some component and, and start by thinking, well, what is, it, what is its specification? Can I, and how will I test against that specification? Um, and uh, yeah, th this is not the only approach to, to this kind of you know, quick check style simulating blah, blah, blah approach, but it's a, it's a fairly general one that works even for, um, even for stateful components. But it's particularly good when you've got stateful components if you can run your implementation in simulation so that you can do things like faster than real time, right? So we don't have to wait 20 seconds for every, right? So um, this leads on to techniques of how do we write, uh, you know, how do we write stateful code where we can abstract it in such a way that we can actually run it in simulation. I mean, you know, in our code, we've got lots and lots of abstractions over, over effects, um, but not always in such a way that it's easy for us to run them in simulation faster than real time. Um, and being able to do that is really useful to be able to do this kind of quick check style, you know, to do this kind of setup. Um, so that, that's a useful thing to also keep in mind when you're starting a new development of a new component. Can I run this thing in simulation and, and for real? Any other questions that anyone wants to raise about, about this? Okay, all right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>